Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, I, I, this is a, a, a real privilege and opportunity. Um, what I wanted to talk today is, is, is uh, you know, more about cryptogenic stroke, and I think that we're definitely going to lead more into the latter part of the talk discussing, uh, you know, studies that are looking very specifically at atrial fibrillation. But I wanted to be able to give you uh, more of the, the overall general cardiologist perspective with the approach to uh, working up uh, cryptogenic stroke. So um, as for my disclosures, I work as a supervising physician for Metacomp Inc. Metacomp is a company that basically deals with Holter monitoring and event monitoring. Um, but I act as a compliance officer. I sign papers for them so that they can be able to stay in business, and that's really my only, uh, you know, uh, affiliation with them. Um, if uh, it means anything, uh, I don't. We don't even use them in my office. We actually use their competitor. So that's how you know where the loyalty lies. In terms of the outline of the talk today, uh, I'd like to talk about what the definition of cryptogenic stroke is, uh, the mechanisms of embolism, and uh, go through some case studies because I always think it's, it's best to be able to go through. Uh, the information in a case-based fashion, and then discuss some of the literature uh, supporting uh, uh, some of the points that I'll make, summarize, and then there will be time for questions there at the end. So the definition of cryptogenic stroke dates back to 1993 where there was a trial called the TOAST trial that led to the TOAST criteria of mechanisms of stroke. And it's defined as a brain infarction that is not attributable to a source of definite cardioembolism, large artery atherosclerosis, or small artery disease despite extensive vascular, cardiac, and serologic evaluation uh, to look into the etiology of it. And the toast categorization of different types of strokes, like I said, was published uh, following a, a, a trial that was done in 1993, and categorized stroke into being large artery atherosclerotic, uh, cardioembolism, small vessel occlusion, such as is seen in different lacunar syndromes, and a stroke of other, undeter of other determined etiology in which we do know what's going on, but obviously it's outside of the realm of these other categories. And then there's also stroke of undetermined etiology, and that could be because there are possibly more than one potential cause for the stroke, uh, or because there is an entirely negative evaluation uh, during the workup of that stroke, which again falls into being cryptogenic, or there is an incomplete evaluation of the stroke, just meaning that there are further uh, studies that are pending. The TOAST trial also made a point of outlining many of the different high-risk sources of cardioembolism as well as medium-risk sources of cardioembolism. As you can see there, some of them are ones that we're very familiar with. Uh, some high-risk uh, you know, sources of stroke are mechanical prosthetic valves, mitral stenosis with AFib, uh, atrial fibrillation other than just a lone episode, uh, recent myocardial infarction, and then some of the medium-risk sources go back to atrial flutter, uh, patent foramen ovale, uh, et uh, etc. So looking at the epidemiology and the risk factors for cryptogenic stroke, cryptogenic stroke accounts for approximately 25% to 40% of all ischemic strokes. Um, it is seen more commonly amongst African Americans and amongst Hispanics compared to whites. There's much more of a prevalence in that population. Uh, it's associated with patent foramen ovale and atrial septal defects or atrial septal aneurysms. Now, as many people you know, do know here, 20 to 25% of the population has a PFO. But uh, in this population of cryptogenic stroke, uh, it is, there is a, a more common association with this uh, congenital heart defect um, uh, period. So uh, there's also an association with intrapulmonary right to left shunts or pulmonary arteriovenous malformations. What's not associated is there does not seem to be a predilection for age. Uh, cryptogenic stroke can occur in all age uh, brackets. Um, there's not a predilection for gender. Um, diabetics, uh, there seems to be a representation of diabetics in cryptogenic stroke, the same as there are in other stroke syndromes. Um, in terms of uh, hypertensives, it's actually cryptogenic stroke is uh, less common in hypertensives, and, and hypertension is more commonly associated with lacunar syndromes or other types of stroke. And smoking is also not associated with uh, cryptogenic stroke. So some of the various mechanisms. Um, cardiac embolism from atrial fibrillation, uh, as we talked about, you know, as I showed you before in that previous slide from the TOAST trial, all of those high risk and medium risk factors 
uh, that are you know, very numerous that have to do with endocarditis to prosthetic valves, uh, to cardiac arrhythmias, et cetera. Uh, also aortic atheromatous disease or other uh, cardiac sources of emboli. Uh, paradoxical embolism uh, due to atrial septal abnormalities that can happen. You know, we uh, are familiar, I think, with thinking about uh, people that can have deep vein thromboses or other vein thromboses that can then embolize up to the heart, to the right side of the heart, cross over a patent foramen ovale or ASD and then enter the systemic circulation leading to uh, cerebral infarction. Uh, thrombophilia is also very important. Um, there's a preclinical pre or subclinical cerebrovascular disease as, as a primary uh, plaque rupture uh, etiology and then also uh, uh, primary inflammatory processes. So the first case that I'd like to go through is uh, Mrs. AA. So this is a 67-year-old female with a history of mild hyperlipidemia, controlled hypertension, who presented to the ER with several hours of word-finding difficulty and mild dysarthria. And uh, this happened to resolve prior to her arrival to the, uh, to the ED. The initial CT scan showed no acute infarct and no acute bleed and the MRI showed uh, multifocal ischemic CVA suggestive of an embolic etiology. Her past medical history is really notable just for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and GERD. Uh, medications are as listed. Uh, no significant uh, you know, social or family history related to the event. This is her presenting EKG, which is you know, the typical case of most of our people that present with cryptogenic stroke is, is that we're not left enlightened we're often left a little bit more confused because they're in normal sinus rhythm typically and doing well. And that's exactly what she was found to be in. So her hypercoagulable workup was entirely within normal limits. She had an MRA of her head and neck that did not show any evidence of large vessel disease or occlusion. And she had a transesophageal echocardiogram that I performed that showed no evidence of left atrial or left atrial appendage thrombus. She had grade one to grade two atheroma that was seen in the descending thoracic aorta as well as the aortic arch, which is very mild atheroma. It's basically layering, a little bit of lumps and bumps, but nothing very serious or mobile. And there were no ulcerations seen to uh, the atheroma at that time. So we were left with this question of, you know, what exactly caused her stroke to happen? And what other tests should be ordered? What, what should we do? Where should we go from here? What should we do next? Any thoughts from the audience? The aortic lesion? It's very mild. It's very mild. Yeah, so it's just, just grade one, grade two atheromas. Yeah, so just basically just streaking through the aorta and nothing mobile, pedunculated, large, just very, very small stuff. A trial that gave us some insight into what is what would be a good next step in the workup of this patient is a trial that was published in 2012 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it's called the ASSERT trial. So in this study, there were 2,580 patients that were uh, greater than or, you know, uh, or equal to 65 years of age. They all were hypertensive, and they had no known history of atrial fibrillation. They all had had a recent pacemaker or defibrillator that had been implanted. Um, this was an uh, international study that enrolled in 23 countries, and the enrollment was over about five years. The two objectives of this study were to prospectively evaluate whether patients with subclinical atrial fibrillation, so people just walking around through society that are having AFib and never know it, and if we can detect this by an implantable device, do they have an increased risk of stroke or thromboembolism? Or does somebody have to be clinical and note it? Does it have to be for a much greater period of time in order for it to, to reach uh, some sort of significance uh, clinically with their risk of thromboembolism? And then there was also a randomized trial of the efficacy of overdrive pacing and preventing clinical atrial fibrillation that could be programmed into the defibrillator. So the design of the trial were that the device had been implanted, the people were enrolled, and then at a follow-up appointment in the clinic three months later post-device implantation, and they had already needed the device for some other reason. This was not, they weren't enrolled to receive a pacemaker. These were people that we were already getting it for sick sinus syndrome or some other clinical indication. They had their device checked three months later and uh, it was interrogated and was uh, used to assess for subclinical AFib that lasted greater than six minutes. Now there have been previous studies that have been done that have shown that AFib that lasts for greater than five minutes does turn out to be clinically significant in terms of your risk for stroke. And so they cho chose to use uh, this uh, conservative cutoff of at least that uh, duration of time. 
So the mean follow-up was uh, two and a half years. So at three months, 261 patients, or 10%, had subclinical atrial tachyarrhythmias. Now, this is the verbiage they use in the paper that I've reproduced for you there. Those subclinical atrial tachyarrhythmias are AFib. The mean atrial rate that was clocked on the pacemaker was about 380. So there's, it's, it was not ambiguous. Um, roughly 35% of patients had atrial tachyarrhythmias detected during the two and a half year follow-up period, which is a very significant percentage of people. During the course of the study, clinical atrial fibrillation developed in only about 16% of patients. Now, what is clinical AFib? Clinical AFib would be a situation in which you actually feel palpitations. You present to a physician, and somebody checks you with a halter, does an EKG, and actually discovers atrial fibrillation. So this suggests that there's a very significant lag between subclinical events and detection. Remember, you have about 35% over two and a half years that were detected by the devices, and only 16% during the two and a half years were found clinically. So the median time to detection of the first atrial tachyarrhythmic event was approximately 35 days. A Holter monitor is 24 hours. An extended Holter monitor is 48 hours. An event monitor goes up to 30 days. None of these will catch this. So subclinical atrial tachyarrhythmias were independently associated with an increased risk of clinical AFib. The hazard ratio is about 5.5. And it was also independently associated with ischemic stroke or systemic embolism. And the hazard ratio in that population that it was discovered was 2.5. So the population attributable risk of stroke or systemic embolism with these subclinical bouts of AFib that were found is about 13%. And this is in line with what has been reported in uh, Framingham studies in the past. The next trial is a trial called the Crystal AF trial. And this was uh, published, uh, I think, within the last couple of years, last year or two, uh, in New England Journal of Medicine. And this is the association between cryptogenic stroke and underlying AFib. So in this trial, 440 patients that were greater than 40 years old had suffered a cryptogenic stroke or a TIA within the last 90 days, and those people were enrolled in this trial. They were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to receive either an implantable loop recorder device and what an implantable loop recorder is, for if, there's, uh, if there are people sitting in the audience that have not heard of what the device is, is that it is a small device and it's now about the size of the clip on a pen. They used to be the size of flash drives. And what we do is we make a little small incision just adjacent to the sternum and slide this little flash drive device underneath the skin and then stitch up the skin. And these loop recorders can uh, be left to uh, monitor the heart for up to several years. And uh, Medtronic, who did sponsor this study, by the way, um, has come up with a smaller device, which is called a link loop recorder, which they used for this study, which is now basically a loop recorder auto injector, in which we make a small skin nick, and you just punch a gun, and it shoots it underneath the skin. It's faster than ever, and it's, a very, it's, it's much simpler. Half the people received that loop recorder. The other half of people received usual care, and usual care was left up to the discretion of the physician, which could be that they will get regular EKGs on them under some sort of uh, regular time interval, say every two weeks, every 30 days, Holter monitors, event monitors, et cetera. But it was definitely left up, it was left up to the physician's discretion. So there were 55 study centers in the US, Canada, and Europe. The enrollment was over approximately three years. The primary endpoint was the time to detection of the first episode of AFib at six months of follow-up. The secondary endpoint was the time detection of the first episode of AFib at 12 months, recurrent stroke or TIA, and then the use of oral anticoagulants. So the rate of detection of AFib in the, implant, in the uh, loop recorder group at six months was approximately 9% versus about 1.5% in the control group. And the median time from randomization to detection of AFib was about 41 days in the implantable loop recorder group and 32 days in the control group. You know, and this, I, I don't think this is surprising. I mean, if you have a device that's in there that's watching you all the time, you expect to pick up more than something that is just randomly sampled at short time snippets. But this is also very interesting. If you look at what the yield is of all of the testing that we're doing to try to hunt these things down. So these three episodes, these three patients in the control group, it took 88 EKGs 
20 24 hour Holter monitors and one event recorder just to be able to yield those three episodes that were found. So we're using a great deal of resources to be able to try and find these things and we're not finding them as well. So this is the, if you look at the uh, the x-axis, that is the months since randomization. The y-axis is the percentage of atrial fibrillation that, that is detected. And you can see it's blown up. The red line is the loop recorder group. The control group uh, is the usual care is in blue. And so, you know, after approximately six months, they were able to detect about 9% of, uh, of patients having AFib. After about 12 months, that went up to almost 14%. And if you fast forward out to 36 months, approximately 30% of this group of patients that had cryptogenic stroke that were enrolled were discovered by this implantable loop recorder. So at 36 months, the control group is still less than 5% detection in there. So it's, it's very significant in terms of difference. And, and also, I don't, I don't think it's any big surprise. I think Medtronic knew this was going to be a slam dunk. Um, it was not powered to, to detect that because there's only 400 and some. It's, it's one of the secondary endpoints, that's right. But what it, what it was is as a secondary endpoint, there was a difference. There was lower in the implantable loop recorder because they were initiated on oral anticoagulants, but they really hedged their bets of stating that as a true. They didn't want to come out and say, well, you can prevent stroke now with this because it wasn't a large enough powered trial to be a stroke prevention trial. But it, it, it was noted. So what should we do next with our patient who's now essentially had a cryptogenic stroke? Should we do serial EKGs, Holter monitoring, event monitoring, or the loop recorder? I think going low budget and less invasive is always the best way. So I set her up for a 30-day event monitor just to be able to clear it. If you can find it within the first week and it happens, that's terrific. It's terrific for you. It's terrific for the patient. They don't have to undergo a procedure but there was no AFib that was found in this patient. I subsequently implanted a loop recorder, and within the first 37 days after implanting it, she had her first episode of AFib. And I initiated Eliquis for thromboembolic prophylaxis at that time. Um, she, you know, rather ironically, has now developed persistent atrial fibrillation and is now awaiting ablation uh, coming up within the next month or two. So case number two is a gentleman by the name of Mr. J.R., He's a 71-year-old gentleman with a history of hypertension. He presented to Santa Barbara Cottage with about 40 minutes of right-sided weakness. He was found on CTA of the head and neck to have a left MCA occlusion, and um, the symptoms resolved after treatment with, with TPA. Um, subsequent angiography did not reveal any significant obstructive cerebrovascular disease uh, following that event. So his past medical history is as stated there. He has no known history of atrial fibrillation. Medications are as stated. Social history, uh, he did have a 15-pack uh, year smoking history, quit approximately 20 years ago, <clears throat> but otherwise really unremarkable. Uh, father, there was a history of ischemic heart disease. He passed away at uh, 78 years old. So the initial transthoracic echocardiogram showed a normal EF. There was no evidence of any valvular vegetations that were seen on that TTE. Um, there was no evidence of right to left shunt or interatrial septal aneurysm, um, but there was spontaneous echo contrast that was seen. And what that is, is it is a sign of stasis of blood within the chamber, within the left upper chamber of the heart. It can be seen actually in any chamber of the heart, but specifically his was seen in the left atrium. And any time that there is stasis of blood or hypocontractility of a chamber, there can be minor rouleau formations that happen with the red blood cells and increased interactions between, uh, between platelets as well, too, that end up causing this phenomenon, this echo phenomenon that literally looks like, like snow or sludge or slime getting washed around inside of the chamber. He was found to be normal sinus rhythm on telemetry during his hospitalization. His hypercoagulable workup was also within normal limits. So, what else would, should we do for Mr. JR, given the findings of what we have so far while he's an inpatient? We should do a transesophageal echocardiogram. So this is a study that was published in circulation, I believe, in, in 2006, where they compared TEE to transthoracic echo in management of patients that have had uh, TIAs uh, or stroke. Uh, there were 230 patients that were enrolled with TIA or stroke. 
of no definite cause. And so these are cryptogenic stroke patients, and this was done over a period of approximately two years. <clears throat> the patients underwent both transthoracic echo and transesophageal echo. And the major risk factors for stroke that we had talked about, which is left atrial appendage thrombus, which is um, you know, also uh, 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 spontaneous echo contrast, um, uh, other factors that were listed on, that, on uh, that, those uh, major risk factors that I showed you on the initial uh, slide from the TOAST trial. Um, those were seen along with, any, along with other absolute indications for oral anticoagulation in approximately 20% of patients. Um, and this was 46 patients out of the 231. And 16% uh, of these findings, so 38 out of these, 40, of these 46 findings, were only identified on transesophageal echo and could not be seen on transthoracic echo. And the primary driver of the, that difference is the recognition of left atrial appendage thrombus. That was the most commonly observed major cardiac risk factor that was seen that could not be seen on transthoracic echo. The first column off to your, off to your left is transthoracic echo. Transesophageal echo is on the right, and to the left are the potential cardiac sources. So if you take a look at the, fr and, and what you see there are absolute numbers underneath the column of TTE and TEE of patients that had those specific risk factors or findings, and then in parentheses is the percentage of the total. And so if you look at left atrial appendage thrombus, which is the third down, that was recognized in 38 patients via TEE, which made up 16% of the total group there. And another uh, finding that's, you know, is, is important to note that uh, may not be appreciated otherwise is if you look at Peyton Foramen Valley down here toward uh, the middle, toward the bottom, uh, it was recognized in 12 patients in TEE, but was only, uh, but was not, uh, rec was only recognized in three patients um, via TTE. So there are PFOs, small PFOs, that can potentially be associated with these embolic events that will go unrecognized. And then the other big one to point out at the bottom is aortic plaques. You're not going to see aortic plaque very well on a transthoracic echo. You have to have a very thin patient. You have to use a suprasternal notch um, uh, tech uh, uh, you know, view, which is very uncomfortable for the patient and hard to position them in. And then you have to be able to try to see the intima of the aorta very crisp and clearly, which is something that is almost impossible to do but can be done very, very easily on a transesophageal echo very well. And this is just more of an illustration of what we were talking about before. It's just looking at the pluses and minuses of what was seen on transthoracic versus TEE during the finding. But basically, it comes down to that the TEE was, was far more sensitive at being able to detect these things. This is another paper that was published in 1997 in the, in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. And this is a very, very interesting paper. What they wanted to do is they wanted to see what was the accuracy of transesophageal echo compared to histologic examination. So they took 62, or I'm sorry, it's 31 patients, but they looked at 62 separate aortic segments um, in, in uh, patients that were undergoing repair of an aortic aneurysm or of dissection in which those segments were going to be excised and removed and could then be examined. And these people all had intraoperative TEEs before. They were given grades to their aortic plaque and an estimate of whether uh, of what first the gradation of the aortic plaque is, how severe is it, and also is it ulcerated or is there any evidence of thrombus that's there? And then once it was excised, it was then examined uh, you know, pathologically. As you can see, if you look in the upper left, this is an example of grade one atheroma, and it's just streaking. And so if, if you look at the bright white ring along the aorta that's coming along down like this, that is uh, just minor streaking along, along the, uh, the tunica intima. And you can see it uh, displayed in the pathologic specimen up there at the top under I with the arrow. Grade two atheroma, uh, means that there is a mild amount of plaque that is beyond streaking to where there is a, a, a well-defined layer. And if you look at the path specimen as well, too, um, you can be able to see that. So this is an example of grade 4 atheroma. So this means that it is very severe. It is greater than 5 millimeters in thickness. And it is not sessile, it's not fixed, it's actually mobile and even pedunculated and moving. And this is very, very high risk. 
The study found that uh, histologic and TEE correlations were about 73% in agreement, which is pretty good. And most discrepancies were found in the TEE's inability to detect superficial ulcerations. So they probably got the grade correct, but they weren't able to say, oh, this is definitely an ulcerated plaque with formed thrombus. It was much easier to be able to obviously do looking at it under a, under a microscope. Um, the ability to separate low grade, which is grade one and grade two, versus high grade, which is three and four, was about 93% accurate by TEE. So TEE is a pretty good tool. And for the identification of thrombus, TEE had a sensitivity of 91% and a specificity of 90%. It's a pretty darn good test. And so in these patients, I think it's, def it's you know, you know, clearly indicated to be able to do. So getting back to our case, our gentleman had a transesophageal echocardiogram. And other than aortic plaque, what we ended up seeing was that. And so this is a 60 degree short axis view of the aortic valve. And what you see is this little sickle shaped pocket sitting next to it, which is the left atrial appendage. And that is a very large thrombus sitting within the left atrial appendage. So he was subsequently placed on Coumadin. Uh, outpatient event monitoring for 30 days did not reveal any evidence of atrial fibrillation. I have since put a loop recorder in this gentleman and we've been following him for five months and there still is no evidence of atrial fibrillation, but we're understandably anticoagulating him because we have a big smoking gun that we're able to see. TEE is very easy to do and there are very few real contraindications to doing a TEE. You can do TEEs on people with liver disease, with severe coagulopathies, you can do them on people that are intubated, that are sick in the ICU, on pressors, hypotensive. I mean, you can do them in a variety of different situations. The risk of complications with them is very low. It's sub 1%. The, the probe itself is about the width of your finger. And, it's, and it is, we use approximately 35 centimeters um, and are able to pass it down. And it, usually uh, Versed and fentanyl which is what we use unless there's uh, you know, some other contraindication to doing it. But it's, it's usually a very similar uh, type of uh, uh, conscious sedation procedure as you use for an endoscopy. Yeah. Um, the main contraindication or the main difficulty with TE is people that, that actually have uh, ankylosing spondylitis or have uh, a fusion of their cervical vertebrae because the esophagus runs along the ridge of the vertebrae, and especially when the spine, when you don't have the natural curvature of the cervical spine, um, it is a blind intubation. And so un unlike an EGD where you have a camera where you're flying and you can steer it, I can't steer the TE probe. The patient has to swallow it. So there is the uh, feared complication of a TE, while it's, while it's rare, in those types of patients is, is that if you push, you may push the esophagus against the vertebral bodies and shred the esophagus and perforate it. But that's outside of that. There, there are very few concerns usually with performing it. So what's the real answer? Do I do a transthoracic echo or do I do a transesophageal echo? The answer is, is that these studies are complementary. One does not replace the other. One is not superior to the other. It doesn't matter if you're talking about cryptogenic stroke or you're talking about anything else that you're trying to examine cardiovascularly. The reason being is because when you do a transthoracic echo, you're taking images from the outside of the chest and the way the heart is positioned is that the right-sided chambers are pointed more anteriorly. The heart is actually juxtaposed as such, so the right side is anterior and the left side is posterior lateral. So you're going to get beautiful pictures with the transthoracic echo of the right ventricle, the right atrium, of the septum, et cetera, yet you're going to you know, lose some information as you're trying to image the left side of the heart. The esophagus runs posteriorly. It actually abuts the left atrium. So you get gorgeous pictures of the left side of the heart. So that's why both of these studies together are so helpful and you know, always recommended to have both for you know, the maximum amount of information that you can be able to uh, you know, acquire. Um, but just realize that in terms of sources of stroke, many of the things that we're looking for you will not find on a transthoracic echo. They need to be, if, 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 the, if the MRI, if the CT is very highly suggestive of an embolic CVA, that patient should have a TEE. So this is probably lending toward the question about Lariat in a very indirect fashion. This is a review paper that was just published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology just a few months ago. And it's a beautiful review. And I highly recommend you know, that, that you take a moment to be able to read it. And what it's really looking at, or what it's addressing, is this condition of the left atrium that is, we're now being 
you know, that we're now calling a fibrotic atrial cardiomyopathy. Atrial fibrillation is a symptom of this heart muscle disease. It, AFib in and of itself does not necessarily cause strokes. AFib is more of a symptom of this heart muscle disease. AFib may help it along, but as you'll see as I'm going to discuss this here, these are three trials. One is the ASSERT trial that we went over earlier. Um, and uh, that was the trial in which patients had already had Im uh, you know, d implantable device. They had pacemakers or ICDs and were tracked, looking for AFib burden. The next trial is, two trials are trials that I didn't go through, the TRENDS trial and the IMPACT trial. And if you look in red, what, what red signifies, and you know, the, the y-axis there is, is percentage of time. So in red is the detection of atrial fibrillation among patients with a thromboembolic event during the study period of the trial. So that's during the entire couple years. You know, we, you know for a cert it was during two and a half years of the trial. And blue is the detection of atrial fibrillation within 30 days before the thromboembolic event, so before their stroke. And it, look across all those trials. Look at what you see. What you see is, is that there is a temporal dissociation between whether people have atrial fibrillation, when they have atrial fibrillation, and when they have a stroke. You can have a, you can have a stroke and have not had AFib for months. And you won't have AFib for another six months. And the reason for that is this schematic. And this is based upon a lot of basic science data of what we know so far about atrial fibrillation. If you look off to the far left, there is in some people a genetic predisposition to this. There is a familial predisposition in some people, but that's not the lion's share. The lion's share of the population uh, is, does not have a very strong genetic pro a predisposition. Our coronary artery disease patients, we, function, we, we, we focus very, very much on what their starvation is to their ventricle. But they also incur atrial infarctions. They also incur atrial ischemia. And there is fibrosis that happens with the atrium. There is cellular senescence that also occurs. Hypertension causes longstanding stretch and scar tissue formation within the left atrium. This promotes inflammation. Valvular congestive heart failure, if you have a leaky mitral valve, if you have a stenotic mitral valve. Diabetes, diabetes causes microvascular um, ischemia and problems with the atrium. It also causes inflammation that then leads to fibrosis. What you then have is an activation of fibroblasts and pro-inflammatory um, you know, chemicals that leads to fibrosis and then you end up with basically a fibrotic left atrium. And from that, you develop stasis. That fibrotic left atrium becomes hypocontractile. The endothelium is altered. And you essentially have, you've begun to fulfill Verkaus triad. You have inflammation that's there. And so then you become prothrombotic. And this is the theory behind how this lead, you know, why we have this temporal dissociation. But it's important to remember that atrial fibrillation is just a marker. It's a marker of heart muscle disease as anything else. Every single patient that comes into my office that has new onset AFib, I not only want to know how much AFib they're having, how fast they're going and are they under control, are they protected with an anticoagulant, which they're going to get, but I also want to know why they have AFib. Do they have a valve problem? Every single one of those patients is going to get a sleep study. I don't care if they're 90 pounds. They're getting a sleep study. We need to, we need to know. Another thing that is not listed up here, but there's a very interesting paper. I don't know if, uh, if you guys have seen it published in, uh, I forget which journal, but it just came up as, a, as an article in Medscape the other day. It uh, was a study that looked at sheep. And with these sheep, they took one group of sheep and actually overfed them and then took another group of sheep and just fed them a regular diet. And these, these, these sheep that were overfed, their left atria were larger in size. They did electroanatomical mapping on them in which they were looking to see is their fragmentation of their normal electrical pattern. And they found out that it was severely fragmented. And then they went ahead and dissected them and found out that there were all kinds of fibrotic scars and stretch within their left atrium compared to the control. 
And so there is a huge belief right now that one of the main problems is also obesity. There are thin people that have AFib. There definitely are. There's tons of them. But it is a huge problem with obesity. They had a larger amount of adiposity that was in the pericardium and that actually had begun to infiltrate the left atrium. And so, it, you know, it, what, what's believed is, is that it's, all of those fat cells are functioning in a paracrine fashion basically secreting IL-1 and other cytokines that are basically driving inflammation and, and driving scarring of the left atrium, particularly in obese people. So this fibrotic atrial cardiomyopathy is something that can be able to be demonstrated on an MRI as well, too. It's not just demonstrated by killing a bunch of sheep that you've overfed. It's, and the, there has been a classification called the Utah stages. And this has also been shown to correlate with what your success of atrial fibrillation ablation is as well, too. It, blue is normal. As you get into the yellow and the reds, that is a more extensive amount of scarring. And patients that have um, a stage 4, a Utah stage 4 fibrosis, in which more than 35% of the left atrium is fibrosed, have a much higher recurrence rate of atrial fibrillation in follow-up after having a single ablation. And this is uh, further characterized by electroanatomical mapping, which is down here, which, you, which, we, which is, you know, we can do in the EP lab. And if you talk with Dr. Gidney, he and many patients that we send to him uh, can be able to predict right away just how well people are going to be able to do. And oftentimes will call me and let me know that their left atrium is full of scar and it looks very problematic. And the other images are of uh, MRI to be able to detect that. So in summary, Cryptogenic stroke occurs in about 25 to 40 percent of ischemic strokes. Um, as much as 30 percent over a three-year follow-up may be due to atrial fibrillation. You should have a low threshold to order a transesophageal echo if the suspected etiology is embolic in nature, and prolonged outpatient monitoring to assess for AFib I think is absolutely paramount. Um, and to consider a loop recorder, uh, you know, if it seems that it's clinically indicated. If this is uh, definitely a very high-risk stroke scenario. Uh, which will very clearly seem to be embolic and nothing's been uncovered, you should have a very low threshold for being able to implant these. Um, the, the infection risk is extremely, extremely low. It's not even close to what it is to, get to receive a pacemaker. It's very easy to implant. It's also very easy to be able to take out, and people can keep them in for up to three years. So, and then, of course, you know, please give us a call if there's any way that we can be able to help or any questions. Yeah. All right. Thank you.